Welcome to Clinical Medicine 2. In this presentation, we will discuss total hip arthroplasty. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge Dr. Greg Ford, who was instrumental in the development of this presentation. By the end of this presentation, the learner should be able to describe the different surgical approaches for total hip arthroplasty and how they may influence physical therapy intervention. Describe the evidence-based physical therapy intervention for individuals with total hip arthroplasty and describe the complications associated with total hip arthroplasty and how they may be prevented. In looking at the handoff study that we just described and looked at the conservative management of those 15 individuals with hip osteoarthritis with manual therapy and therapeutic exercise. If you look at those outcome scores again, you can see that between baseline and eight weeks, the patients did much better with respect to function, pain, and range of motion. However, if you look at those measures at 29 weeks, you can begin to see that pain started to uptick function began to go down just a bit and range of motion began to decrease. And so really what we're doing is we're battling here against time. Um, over time, we know that these joints are going to wear down even more and osteoarthritis will ultimately continue to progress. We can do the best we can to ensure that joints stay mobile, muscles stay flexible, and muscles stay strong. We can also educate the patient with respect to activities, perhaps moving back to those lower impact activities like hiking and biking and swimming versus running. We can also talk to them about weight loss strategies. We can also talk to them about nutrition. All of these things can really factor into try to trying to preserve those joints. However, there is going to be a time when these folks are going to have to transition to total hip arthroplasty for some folks. We certainly see it more at the knee than the hip, but the hip still continues to increase annually. Uh, in, in with respect to the number of total hip arthroplasties done. And I would refer you back to the case that we posted on Monday, the hip osteoarthritis case written by Lorna King. And it talks about a patient who was just trying to, you know, looked like they were buying some time until they wound up having their hip arthroplasty. We hear this a lot that the surgeon said, whenever I'm ready, hear it from patients a lot, whenever I'm ready, uh, he said he, he or she would go ahead and, and, and replace my joint. And so all I'm looking to do is try and buy some time. At the end of the day, these, these arthroplasties, these replacements can last anywhere between 10 and 15 years. Of course, if you're gonna be involved in higher level activities, like if you're a little bit younger, the, life, the, the lifetime um, of, of a device may be a little bit less. And so the key is, I think, to try and push this off as long as possible while trying to let somebody live a high quality of life. And so we can play a role in that with the conservative management of these individuals. Again, there are gonna be a fair number who are gonna go on to arthroplasty, again, more so at the knee than the hip, but we can certainly manage these folks following total hip arthroplasty as well and continue to improve function. It should be noted that sometimes with respect to total knees, you will hear patients who aren't necessarily happy with their outcome. Sometimes their pain's better, but their range of motion may be a little bit limited. Um, the other thing about the hip, though, is that it's 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 pretty uncommon uh, to find to find patients who are not happy with their hip. Many patients who have hip surgery replacement um, note decreased pain almost immediately, and they're quite happy with their outcome. And again, physical therapists play a key role in that. So we'll spend the next part of the, the remainder of this lecture talking about total hip arthroplasty and rehabilitation associated with it. In this slide, we see a figure that shows us the annual number of total hips that are likely going to be done, as well as total knees, up to the year of 2030. And this is a paper published in 2007, really looking at projections of total hip and total knee arthroplasties over the course of the next several years. And so again, there are many more total knees done than total hips in this country. And we can also see on the bottom graph, we can also see that with respect to revision surgeries, meaning that the prosthesis has worn out, it has to be replaced. We're gonna see a number of revisions as well for the, for the knee as well as the hip. But if you look at the curves for the hip 
we can see they're just slightly trending upward, meaning that we're going to likely see an increase in both of these over time. With respect to the bottom graph, again, it's important to note that these prostheses typically last around 15 years. Less if you're going to be more active and younger, longer if you're a little bit older and, and, and not as active, but it's important to know that these procedures are not going away anytime soon. They're going to continue, and we play a role in the management of these folks following surgery. An important part of total hip arthroplasty is going to be the pre-surgical phase, specifically where the physical therapist gets a visit or two with the patient to discuss some very, very important concepts. And the first concept that we want to discuss is the rehab that they're going to be participating in after surgery. And so from the time when they're in the hospital after surgery, we can instruct them in the basic exercises they'll be performing like ankle pumps, quad sets and glute sets, and we can discuss even our post-surgical protocols with them so they have some understanding of where those, those next several weeks after surgery are going to take them. We want to discuss ambulation following surgery as well. Most of these patients will be either weight-bearing is tolerated or partial weight-bearing, and so they're going to need an assistive device. Normally, you can instruct them in the use of a walker. I think that's fair, especially while they're in the hospital, but make sure they know how to use the walker on level surfaces as well as um, the ability to ascend and descend stairs. Discussing goals with the patient and looking at their functional status is going to be important. The vast majority of these patients, up to 90%, usually go home after surgery, right? They spend a couple days in the hospital and they go home after surgery. However, we do have that 10%. These are typically folks who are a little more limited functionally prior to surgery that may need a short-term rehab stay or potentially spend some time with a family member just so that they're safe. And those goals of the patient are going to be important. So is their goal to go home after surgery? Um, are they going to utilize home health? Are they going to come for outpatient physical therapy? If they're going to come for outpatient physical therapy, you need to make sure you let them know that they're going to have to have a ride uh, to therapy because for the first six weeks, they likely can't drive. And so these are important points that you want to square away prior to surgery. There'll also be obviously the surgeons involved, the surgeon's team. There'll likely be a social worker and discharge planning involved with this prior to surgery as well. So this isn't necessarily all on PT, but I think it's important to bring these issues up because those are all factors that are going to play into their post-operative rehabilitation capabilities. Before we move on to post-operative rehabilitation considerations following hip replacement. I want you to take a moment and just watch this brief video. It's only about two minutes long, but it shows a total hip arthroplasty through a posterior lateral approach. And we'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes, but that's an important approach. It's done a lot, and it's an important approach because it approaches the hip posteriorly by splitting uh, gluteus maximus, taking down a deep rotators, and accessing the hip through the back. The concern with that is, is that there's some precautions, some movement precautions, specifically flexion, adduction, and internal rotation associated with that. But as you're watching the video, just consider some of the implications that you may see for rehabilitation down the road. Following surgery, there's a couple of key components that we want to inquire about. The first is going to be the weight-bearing status of the patient. And the weight-bearing status of the patient really is going to be driven by how the prosthesis is fixated. We're also going to want to know about dislocation precautions, and that's going to be driven by the type of surgical approach that's used. And then we want to know were there any intraoperative complications that we need to be aware of. And so those are all factors that we're going to want to take into, take into consideration before we begin to work with the patient while they're still in the hospital. With respect to weight bearing, much of that will be driven by whether or not the prosthesis was cemented or not. And so you can look at on the left there, we see a graphic that shows the interface of the prosthesis with respect to bone and we see cement in there. So that's medical grade cement that's used in this case. And we typically uh, see joints that are cemented when we deal with individuals who don't have very, very good bone quality going into surgery. Contrast that with on the right where we see the prosthesis and then we see bone and we see porous coating covering the metal prosthesis.
that porous coating, right, the bone will grow into that. And if we use a non-cemented technique, we're going to look to the, for the bone to grow into the porous coating and secure the prosthesis in that manner. Now, with respect to the non-cemented approach, that's going to take probably at least about six weeks for that to occur. But in the end, that's likely going to um, allow the prosthesis to last a little bit longer by having that non-cemented approach. And so with respect to a cemented hip, these are individuals that can weight bear almost immediately. The non-cemented hip, these are folks that we're going to have some restrictions on weight bearing for a period of time following surgery. And this table here provides a little more information for you on the weight bearing of patients with respect to the component fixation. And so again, if we're dealing with a cemented hip, we're dealing with immediate post-operative weight bearing. If we're dealing with uncemented femoral and acetabular components, weight bearing is going to be restricted to allow that bone to grow into the prosthesis normally for about six weeks. But in some cases, if bone quality isn't that great, it could take a little bit longer. And then we'll also see some hybrid components being used where we see a cemented femoral component and an uncemented acetabular component. In this particular case, we usually see weight bearing um, uh, allowed to be immediate following surgery within the patient's tolerance because of that cemented femoral component. And so again, Understand if you're dealing with a cemented or a non-cemented procedure because that's going to drive your weight bearing for the patient immediately when they're in the hospital and then down the road long term as well. One of our other concerns following surgery is going to be the approach that was utilized. In the video that you watched a few slides back, that was a posterior lateral approach that was done. And when you saw that posterior lateral approach occurring, you saw that the gluteus maximus is going to be split. And then we're going to take down those deep rotators so we can get to the hip. After the hip is replaced, the joint capsule is going to be closed, the rotators are going to be repaired, and we're going to go ahead and uh, let that gluteus maximus come back to its normal position. Bottom line here, though, is that with that particular approach, that posterior lateral approach, the most common uh, complication that we see are going to be dislocations, especially posterior. They're going to happen posterior if they're going to happen at all. And so we want to have some precautions with respect to range of motion. Um, specifically with that posterior lateral approach, we want to limit flexion greater than 90 degrees, no adduction across midline, and no internal rotation. If we're going to have an interlateral approach done, if we see that, the limitations there with respect to range of motion are likely going to be a little less restrictive, meaning that the ones that you might want to consider just because of the arthrokinematics of the joint would be no hip extension beyond probably end range and no internal rotation, again, beyond end range. Um, and you also likely want to, want to limit adduction as well. However, because you're not cutting through muscle, Right? We have a good support structure in place. We're cutting through the fascial planes. We don't see dislocations with this anterior approach. And so again, for a posterior lateral approach, our limitations are going to be no uh, flexion beyond 90, no adduction across midline, and no internal rotation. With an anterior lateral approach, um, we may see uh, limitations in movement. If we do, they'll likely be for extension and external rotation at end ranges, as well as adduction. Now, how long do these precautions take place? Certainly for a posterior lateral approach, a minimum of six weeks. Uh, you may see some surgeons who are a bit more conservative, say maybe three months. You may see some who say for the rest of their lives, we want them to go ahead and, and maintain these precautions. And if that's the case, right, the surgeon makes a call on that. Good to have that communication uh, between you and the surgeon with respect to that, though. We don't want the individual sleeping on their affected side for a period of time after surgery. And if they do sleep, it should probably be supine, and we use this abduction pillow in between their legs, especially for the posterior lateral approach. When they sit, we're going to use a pillow or an abduction wedge, and that makes sure that the individual is reminded to not cross their legs when they're sitting. And so again, um, these precautions are going to be are going to be important, especially for the posterior lateral approaches, because we want to avoid any problems with respect to dislocations down the road. We've already talked about these a little bit, 
but let's start with these different approaches again. So the anterolateral approach, we're going to work through the interval of the TFL and the rectus femur sartorius. I'm going to show you a video of that on the next slide. But with respect to the posterior lateral approach, we're going to split the gluteus maximus and take down those deep external rotators to get to the capsule. We have to open that capsule up in order to get down to the hip joint to replace it. You saw that on the video a couple slides back. That was a posterior lateral approach. And some of the concerns with that with respect to rehab from an anterior lateral perspective is that we haven't cut through any muscle, right? And so you're not really limited with respect to that. Posterior lateral approach, we split the gluteus maximus, but then we take down those deep external rotators. So we gotta be a little bit concerned about any active external rotation because those muscles are gonna take about six weeks to heal. And so that posterior lateral approach again, because the muscles have been taken down, we've, um, we've taken away that one barrier that hopefully protects the hip. Um, and so poster dislocations, again, are a concern, as well as any active external rotation during those first few weeks after surgery. So in this particular image, we can see the anterior incision there along the anterior aspect of the hip and the lines for the posterior incision as well. Again, the anterior incision, you're going through the junction between the interval between the TFL and the sartorius rectus complex. Posteriorly, we're cutting through gluteus maximus, cutting through those deep external rotators to get to the hip joint capsule. You also see a line right down the lateral aspect of the femur as well. There is a lateral approach that's used as well. And in that particular case, the hip abductor, the gluteus, gluteus medius is taken down uh, in a similar fashion that the hip external rotators are taken down. And so that's, that's, that's gonna have to be surgically repaired following the procedure. We typically don't see that lateral lateral approach done as much, but um, if it is done normally for the next six weeks, we're going to avoid any, any significant loading of the hip abductor uh, muscle until it's fully healed. A few slides back, we had you watch a posterior lateral approach to a total hip. And on this particular uh, video here, I'd like you to watch from 1047 to 1415. This is an orthopedic surgeon who's describing an anterior lateral hip approach. And you'll see it's much different than a posterior lateral approach where we're going through the back again, splitting gluteus maximus, taking down the deep external rotators and accessing the hip through that way. And so I think you'll get a better appreciation for the anterolateral approach. Uh, based upon this particular video. The video is good. I think he's doing a talk. This orthopedic surgeon is doing a presentation for likely maybe patients about this particular approach. And so it's about 20 minutes long. I'm not asking you to watch all of it, just this area right here. And this will give you a good understanding of the anterolateral approach, the technical aspect of it with respect to the surgery. And when we're looking at the comparison of posterior lateral versus anterior lateral approaches to hip replacement, it's important to have an understanding of what patients think and patient values and expectations with respect to the procedures. This is an interesting patient because she's had a posterior approach on one side and an anterior approach on another side, and she's comparing them um, in this video. And I would take a, a moment just to watch it. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, we could watch video after video after video of different orthopedic surgeons who recommend one procedure over the other. The bottom line is that they're both going to be done. It's important for you to be familiar with all the different procedures that are out there and have sound communication strategies with your surgeons since you're going to be working with these folks postoperatively. So, when we think about outcomes following total hip arthroplasty, regardless of technique, there are some overlying factors that are gonna govern outcome, mostly in all cases. Uh, first is gonna be the overall health and activity level of patients. Uh, patients who are a little bit younger, who are a little bit healthier, who weigh a little bit less, overall they're doing better prior to surgery, they're gonna have a better outcome. 
when we start thinking about the bone quality, meaning that if folks have osteopenia or osteoporosis, they're likely going to have a cemented procedure. That is going to probably influence outcome in the long term compared to folks who don't have a cemented procedure where they have good bone quality and it's going to allow that bone to grow into the prosthesis. Also, the skill of the surgeon is going to play into it and the patient's compliance uh, with post-operative care. Um, in this particular study, taking all that into account, this study looked at comparing anterior to posterior approaches with respect to the hip, and they found that at 90 days following surgery, the individuals who had these anterior lateral approaches had significantly less pain as measured by a visual analog scale. They consumed far fewer narcotics, which is important, and they had better hip function as per the Harris hip score. And so at the end of the day, it appears as if these anterior approaches do appear to be uh, a little bit better in terms of outcome. The other uh, interesting concern is that there were no difference, or diff the other interesting finding for this particular paper is that there were no differences in complication rates between both approaches. And so once again, it's gonna be the preference and the choice of the surgeon who's gonna move forward with this. All those other factors we spoke about are gonna play into it. But at the end of the day, it looks as if these anterior approaches do have better outcomes based upon the literature in terms of pain, narcotics, and function. We just described some of the outcomes associated with the anterolateral approach. We spoke previously about the posterior lateral approach having a higher risk of posterior dislocations. The anterior lateral approach we know for sure has a much lower rate of posterior hip dislocations following total hip arthroplasty. That's one of the reasons it's preferred among surgeons. The posterior lateral approach rehab is going to be delayed because we've taken down some of those deep external rotator muscles and we have to allow those to heal. I would say this though, that the posterior lateral approach, um, because there are those contraindications with respect to movement in the first six weeks, with respect to flexion, adduction, internal rotation, folks who have dementia or a history of stroke or a history of seizure disorders, they can't have that posterior lateral approach because they're gonna have likely an inability to potentially follow those contraindications, meaning that these folks are gonna be at much higher risk for a posterior dislocation and an adverse outcome. Following total hip arthroplasty, patients do pretty well with respect to range of motion. These are much different than total knees, where you sometimes have to struggle to try and get that range of motion back. These individuals will get that mobility back uh, mostly by the time they leave the hospital. They're, they're going to be able to get extension to neutral, and they'll be able to get their flexion to 90 degrees. By six weeks post-op, though, we want to ensure that we don't flex that hip beyond 90. And just think about some functional activities like sitting in a low chair or even taking, taking uh, socks and shoes on and off. You need a combined 160 degrees of flexion, abduction, external rotation. If you think that Faber position, right, we need significant mobility. Just do something than taking socks and shoes off. And so these are, these are activities that we're going to want to educate patients on because once again, if they have the posterior lateral approach, they could be a potential risk for a dislocation. And so following any surgery, we know that it's not in the patient's best interest to be lying in bed all the time and being immobile. With that type of a scenario, they're at risk for things like pneumonia, they're at risk for DVT, and they're likely to get weaker. And so we want to make sure that we provide appropriate instruction with respect to use of an assistive device to get the patient up and out of bed several times a day. We want to make sure the positions they need to avoid. We don't want them lying supine for longer periods. Sitting up is going to be much better for them. Um, we also want to make sure that they avoid those positions of uh, concern with respect to range of motion at the hip, especially with a posterior lateral approach. We want to make sure they're instructed in deep breathing and diaphragmatic breathing and coughing exercises. These are going to be important to prevent complications like pneumonia down the road. And certainly ankle pumps, glute sets, quad sets, those are things that patients can do through the course of the day to prevent DVT. But all these are going to be helpful to keep the patient moving, keep the patient healthy, and, and avoid any complications following surgery. There are several other factors that we can educate the patient on as well in the post-surgical phases.
Um, for example, again, with respect to those total hip precautions, if flexion is to be avoided, a raised toilet seat, always sitting at levels um, where you're uh, higher than your knees, so the hips are higher than their knees. Uh, be careful with bending over to pick things up, so we want folks to stay upright. And we want to be real cautious with them doing things like tying their shoes or taking their socks on and off because that can facilitate hip flexion beyond 90. So using shoes that can slip on versus tying makes life much easier for these folks, especially in those early stages following surgery. And as we move through the post-surgical rehabilitation phases, we want to make sure we're consistently evaluating the patient's functional profile. What can they do and what do they ultimately want to get to? And our rehab should kind of focus on that. We want to continue to progress ambulation. We want to continue to work on range of motion within reason. When it's appropriate, begin to strengthen the appropriate muscles that are weak. Certainly the hip abductors and hip extensors are going to be important muscles. Uh, hip abductors are likely going to have been weak prior to surgery, and so making sure that we address strength in that group of muscles is going to be really, really important, especially to minimize uh, Trendelenburg type gates and things like that. At the end of the day, we really want to maximize function. And on the next slide, uh, I'm just going to uh, show you the uh, protocol that we've used at Stanford Health, which is a hospital that, that I've been involved with, um, but I want to show you the protocol on one particular slide, the first part of it at least, and I'll post that protocol for you on the Blackboard site. I would recommend skimming it and taking a look at it and look at the exercises that folks are doing and how those exercises progress at different stages. And so take a moment to review that protocol um, because I think that that's going to give you some indication as to the level of depth that we're going to want to get into with respect to rehabilitation for these patients. Many of you are going to have surgeon specific protocols at hospitals you go to. Some of you maybe won't. You'll get a patient, there won't be a protocol, and you'll have to kind of go off what we're talking about here or based upon the experience of your colleagues. And so it's important to have those resources available to you. But, but, but it, long and short of it is make sure you get a chance to just rehab, look at the protocol, look at the rehab protocol, and just get a handle for the level of effort that the patient's going to have to put in long term here. I don't have a chance clinically to treat patients postoperatively much anymore, um, but when I did, I always enjoyed it, whether it was dealing with individuals who, you know, were in the hospital still as an inpatient, it didn't matter if they were in the home, and it didn't matter if I was seeing them as an outpatient. I always enjoyed managing them because you knew that these folks were in an awful lot of pain prior to surgery, at least with respect to hip and knee replacements and after surgery. Boy, they just don't have that same osteoarthritic ache and sharp pain at these joints anymore. So they always feel better. And they're a fun group of patients to rehabilitate because they want to become more active. And that's really what we're good at, right? Evaluating folks and getting them more active. And that's really the fun part about the job that we have. The other cool thing about post-op rehab is that you're part of a team. You know, when you're working as an inpatient, you're working with the nursing staff, you're working with the discharge planners, you're working with the hospital-based physicians, you're working with the orthopedic surgeons, you know, you're working with the aides, you're working with the radiology team, and so you're working with really everybody involved, and it's fun to be part of part of a team like that. Same, same as on the outpatient side. You know, you're going to be still working with the surgeon, the radiologist, to try and ensure this patient's progressing properly, and so it truly is a team-based approach. And, and on that note, um, normally what you're going to see with most surgeons are different types of preferences. And so this is a sample rehabilitation protocol from the fine folks of Sanford Rehabilitation. This is a group out in the, the Midwest that we've worked with in the past and, and continue to, to, to work with. But they have a, they, they've done a really, really nice job of putting together some protocols. And this is one for this posterior lateral approach following total hip arthroplasty. And I would encourage you to look at it on the Blackboard site and really study it closely and determine if there's any gaps in your knowledge at this point where you look at the protocol and say, boy, I'm not sure if I know how to do that. Or I'm not sure if I know how to do that exercise. And let's talk about those. But take a moment for that. And then as well, once you get out to your outpatient orthopedic clinics, most surgeons are going to have protocols. And that's kind of neat because it's just a nice guideline for you 
it's like having the surgeon there. It's a nice guideline for you to kind of go by. And then if things don't seem to be adding up quite well, you give the surgeon a call and let them know what's going on. But in this type of protocol here, it follows patients out to about three months, divides it in different phases, as you guys are familiar with, based upon tissue healing. And it talks about the activities and the goals for each particular stage. So this is great. And I'd say take a look at it. But this is fun stuff, uh, working with folks following total hip arthroplasty. These folks get better. They do great. And uh, it's fun stuff and fun a fun uh, fun group of patients to be around. The two tables on this particular slide I think are very helpful in trying to have an understanding of the amount of force placed across the hip joint um, for individuals with potentially hip OA or following total joint replacement. And when we begin to look at um, the, the top table, we look at these different loads and then how much body weight it places on them. So anything less than anything less than uh, full body weight, we consider that a low load and then certainly way up to the top, anything more than five times our body weight, we consider those high loads. And so a lot of this deals with the body weight the individual has, but also the effects of gravity as well. And if we move down toward the bottom there, we begin to look at some of the, the activities that we have that are, that are low. Uh, we see passive active assist range of motion, submaximal isometrics and bridging and minimized weight bearing, double leg stance and cycling. So these are great activities that we can do to provide uh, range of motion, some early strengthening for the area, as well as some aerobic activity as well. With respect to biking, although no resistance, you'd say, well, we probably need to have a little bit of resistance with that. And I would probably agree with that. But then if you work over toward the right, we begin to see these activities that are high. And I've already mentioned before, I'm not a huge fan of having patients run and jump who have hip OA, following total hip arthroplasty as well, because it places a lot of force across the hip. And so I think that lower impact activities, hiking, biking, swimming, walking on a treadmill, still gives folks a great workout. You walk on a treadmill, you, you uh, increase the incline a little bit. And you can get a great workout with respect to cardiovascular health, as well as keeping these joints healthy. Two activities there, though, that I think are interesting that elicit high loads at the hip, equivalent to running and jumping, are getting out of low chairs and then walking up and down stairs. Our patients are doing these all the time. And so when we talked way back right, about these clinical practice guidelines, we talked about patients with hip OA and how do we modify some of their activities to spare their hip. Well, in part, part of this is going to be ensuring that patients understand the load they place on their hip with a simple activity like getting in and out of a chair and going up and down stairs. And why I'm not saying that we need to have everybody taking elevators because stairs uh, certainly do allow um, you know a nice little workout kind of midday to do a couple flights of stairs but at the same time you can walk up and down a hallway right i think about ds on our campus yeah i see folks walking up and down our hallway all the time just for fitness that's much safer with respect to loading on the hip than we see pa patients going up and down stairs and so i think that when you start looking at activities and loading strategies for the hip, we want to probably have folks down in that low, low, moderate, moderate range. And that helps certainly spare the hip if we're dealing with OA, but it also helps conserve the hip long term if we're dealing with hip, uh, total hip arthroplasty as well. And so I think that looking at the chart, having an understanding of the forces placed across the hip is important and knowing that you can use this to help you with respect to your patient education and some of your rehabilitation activities. And one of, the, one of the reasons that we see so many patients getting their hips and knees replaced is so they can get back to doing some of the activities they enjoyed before their osteoarthritis got to a point where they had to start to limit activities. And I'm seeing a patient right now with uh, telehealth and she has a history of a total hip replacement. Um, and it's interesting because she had given up cycling because she couldn't flex her hip really beyond about 100 degrees because of pain. And so she'd given up cycling for a long period of time. She had her hip replaced and she was able to get back into doing cycling. And now because of the flexed posture that she's in with long, long, these long rides with her lumbar spine, she has lumbar spine issues as well. And I was speaking to her about it and, and these low impact activities, many patients want to get, get back to doing these activities. So you hear lots of patients say, 
you know, I want to get back to doing golf and I want to get back to cycling or I'd like to get back to bowling or I'd like to get back to swimming. And you've heard me say several times, I think the usefulness of things like hiking, biking, swimming, walking on treadmills are going to be helpful because these are low impact activities. And if we certainly move over to the high impact activities, these are activities that we have lots of concerns with folks getting in, involved with following total hip arthroplasty. The joint really isn't made to take that level of stress. And so we want to keep folks over toward those low impact activities and you say, well, how long does it take for someone to get out to do some cycling or some golfing? or even some bowling. And I'd say, you know, with respect to golfing and cycling and bowling, you know, about three months is normally the time frame that we see. Certainly speak to your surgeons about that, but normally about three months is the time frame where we'll allow folks to kind of go out and, uh, and begin to participate in those type of sports that deal with some, you know, minimal forces on the hip, but certainly they can, they can stress the joint. And so use this as a guide for getting patients back to activities and hopefully we're going to be more toward that low impact side. Along with all of the good news that we have about patients doing well after total hip arthroplasty, getting back to activities like golfing and biking, there's a little bit of bad news associated with these. And so as with any invasive procedure, there's always going to be risk. And one of the risks that we see the most are going to be DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, the concern with these is that many of them can be asymptomatic and they can result in pulmonary emboli, which is a life-threatening condition. And so one of the things that we commonly see done is DBT prophylaxis. And so many surgeons, most surgeons will use anticoagulants post-op to assist um, in, in limiting the rate of DVTs. We want to get patients out of bed on day one following surgery so we know mobility is great bed exercises. We talked about these way back in the beginning of this presentation about the utility of things like ankle pumps, quad sets, and glute sets. Those are all going to be important. And then we can use um, elastic stockings as well as pneumatic calf compression stockings to assist with this as well. And um, DVT is something that we can prevent, keep patients active, right? Ensure they're, ensure they're uh, properly anticoagulated, and that can definitely limit the number of DVTs that we see following surgeries. Of course, dislocation of the hip, and depending upon who you read, you, know, you start looking at some of the older literature with respect to posterior lateral procedures, anywhere up to 5 to 7% of these hips may potentially dislocate, whereas these anterolateral procedures, less than 1%. And so as long as you're uh, continuing to have patients educated on those precautions with respect to flexion, uh, adduction, internal rotation, um, normally those uh, dislocations are very, very minimal. But if they happen, they're a game changer and they really, really do affect rehab. And so these are things that we really want to minimally avoid. Um, with respect to leg length inequality, with the prostheses now and as skilled as surgeons are, we don't see this as much, but occasionally you may see some leg length inequality as some of these prostheses may kind of settle in a little bit. Um, especially in individuals where we're looking at non-cemented hips. So that could potentially be a concern that we may have to deal with. And a really, really bad one will be infection. And infections we typically see early on, like within the first couple of uh, weeks after surgery. And so some of the signs of infection would be redness around the wound, uh, oozing around the incision site, uh, potentially fever, and increased amounts of pain. And normally, uh, staples or stitches are taken out anywhere between 10 to 14 days following these procedures. And so it's usually in that period of time when these folks are most at risk for infections. And when I would work with these folks, I would let them know that every day they should be feeling a little bit better. And when we talk to these few folks who've had infections with respect to the hip, they say that, you know what, day two, I didn't feel so great. Day three, I actually felt worse. Day four, I felt a little bit worse. And we just don't hear that. Each day, these individuals feel a little bit better. And so if you start to hear the story of patients 
telling you that they have redness around the, around the wound site. Take a look at it, look at it, and, and, and see what you think. Um, if there's any drainage from the wound site, increased pain, and certainly potentially a fever. These are individuals who want to get back to the, to the surgeon ASAP um, because there is concern about an infection in those cases. And once again, that can be a game changer as well. So dislocations and infections, those are things we definitely want to prevent. Um, because those are definitely going to influence the longevity of the prosthesis. Another complication that we see that's the most common late complication, so something we see down the road in folks, is loosening of the prosthesis. And so we want to be aware of that. So these are individuals who are going to present to us down the road following their, their arthroplasty. They've been doing well, but all of a sudden they start to note increased pain associated with uh, daily activities. And one of the concerns would be a loosening of that prosthesis. And so who do we see this in? We can certainly see it in folks who have either cemented or uncemented total hip arthroplasty procedures. The cemented component could possibly be to an autoimmune response to that medical grade cement that's used to fixate the device, but likely more common is with respect to bone loss. So over time, uh, these folks are already a little bit older to begin with to get these procedures done. We're gonna to continue to see bone loss. And with that bone loss, we could potentially see uh, loosening of the prosthesis. And certainly for uncemented procedures along the same lines, loosening can potentially continue down the road with bone loss. And so even though these individuals may have good bone quality when the surgery is done, down the road, if we begin to see bone loss, we can get loosening with that as well. And so these are complications you'll see down the road, uh, something to keep in the back of your mind. They don't happen very often, but the bottom line is that they do happen. You need to get back to the surgeon, you need to get some imaging done, take a look at these to determine if we're dealing with loosening of the prosthesis so that can be appropriately managed. So in conclusion, for this particular presentation, we spoke about our treatment-based classification for the hip. I would advise you to go back and review those Rob Roy uh, Martin articles on the hip and read those through and have, have a good understanding of the management strategies we're going to use to manage hip, primary hip pathologies. Also, we talked a fair amount about hip OA and the evidence-based management of that. And we've also spoke a lot about total hip arthroplasty and how we should manage these folks prior to surgery and then following surgery as well. We spoke about some of the complications associated with them, as well as some of the different procedures that we can use and how that might change our rehab. And so I appreciate your attention during the talk. There's an awful lot of material on the website as well on the Blackboard site that's going to help you facilitate your learning with respect to the hip. Take a moment and review that as well. And I appreciate all of you listening in and look forward to seeing you all real soon.